Alright, we're going to do uh, state and local, and what we're going to try and do is do the presentations in about 8 to 10 minutes each, so we have a lot of time for conversation. Yeah, really fast. And so, um, I'm going to just kind of go through who's going to talk about what, and while I do that, I'm going to, I have up on the screen, courtesy of uh, Dave Burson and Nationwide, uh, non-form payroll growth from the peak in 2000 and it reminds us that in um, our country which is a federation of 50 states uh, they're very different they do different things and you can even leave one state for the other and leave your liabilities behind which Rick will talk about <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do here is uh, Flippa who has been for almost a quarter of a century looking at detailed state <laughs> revenue data and other data is going to give us an update on that uh, John's going to talk about do people really believe the data and are they willing to lend them money and probably talk about it. And then we have Darth Vader. <laughs> Rick's going to talk about pensions and, and the pension problem. I, though, I'm going to just put up the anecdote, as unbelievable it may be, to um, public pensions. And so this is um, Bill Strauss's chart, and it's manufacturing output and employment. And so this magical thing, if you can produce the same output or more with the same amount of people, you have a great gain. The question is how to translate that gain into um, other uses, like making pension payments. The other thing I will point out, though, is that productivity is key to pensions because 30% of the dollar that pays a pension was put in by the employee or the employer. 70% is from market growth because nobody wants low wages and low pensions, so they're willing to take the risk with your taxpayer money. So with that, I'm going to let Philippa tell us what's going on, and then John's going to say who's going to pay for it, and then we have Darth Vader. <laughs> So, um, the work that I do is based on the idea that if the people who are looking at the money coming into state tax coffers are surprised, that's worth knowing. So, the first graphs that I'm going to go over here are, the top graph is the share of states that are making their forecasted withheld tax collections. And you can see that the 2001 recession was devastating for the states, and that's work that you and Leslie have also shown. Um, and then the second one is, this is data that we started collecting more recently. So these are the states making positive revenue growth over the year. And the bottom one, which is the most effective with um, actual employment, are the, the yearly growth in revenues. <laughs> And you can see that since the Great Recession, the growth is weaker than it was before. So most of the states are saying that their taxes should be growing at around 6%, but they're growing more at around 3 or 4%. And that's both because of low wages, low wage growth, and also because of um, goods deflation. So when you look at sales taxes, you see the same thing even more so. And remember that, say, in 2009, there were, um, there was a full year of negative retail sales growth, usually maybe a month or two, not a year. Um, in the sales, <laughs> So I go every year to the revenue estimators meetings, and so we and I'm dealing with the estimators, not the policy people or anything. So these are the people who are trying to figure out how, how much taxes are going to grow in a given year. Um, so in the sales tax, you can see. See, I'm pointed in this thing here, but you're looking at that here. Um, you can see up here 
how much sales, how above projections and how strong sales taxes were. And that was very worrisome to the state revenue estimators because they were seeing fully a third of that growth was coming directly from the housing market. This was, you know, just building materials. That's before they're even thinking about equity extraction or real estate commissions and that kind of thing. And so they knew that that was going to crash. And you can see that it started down long before the recession and long before the remittances to Mexico also told us that we were going on here. Um, then the third graph I want to show you is it's noisy, but it's withholding and sales diffusion indexes. So these are the share of states that are making their forecasted collections. And you can see that for the only, you know, they go back and forth, but the only time that sales was completely above withholding was in here during the house bubble. So that was also something that was really worrisome to revenue estimators. And then withheld taxes, we've never been able to figure out what happened here, but somehow it must have been capital gains being realized, something like that, and then the crash. So when we, at the different conferences, there's always sort of a, a theme. And one thing that I thought was really interesting was the most recent revenue estimating conference. The, the papers all sort of centered around tax structures as a reflection of our values. So one person was talking about how there'd been a drop off in local government education work. So that's lost like 1.5 million workers. So while we're complaining about not having a well-educated workforce, we're cutting down the number of local teachers. Um, some, another one was talking about the um, problems with only the South were high-paying jobs growing faster than low-paying jobs. Um, in California, say, low-paying jobs were growing at 2.1%. Um, I mean, high-paying jobs were growing at 2.1, middle-range 2.3, low-range 2.5. So you are seeing some of that kind of growth. Um, so you don't have the kind of wage gains that you'd need to have healthy withholding growth. And you don't have inflation in goods that you would need for sales tax growth. So there's really not much the states can do. And one of the things I just want to throw out there is there's been some recent thinking about <coughs> public financed research because materials research, basic materials, R&D, is too risky and it's too slow for the private sector. So the private sector is great at developing the applications, but that research really has to come from publicly financed work. And some people, Mariana Mazzucato among them, are suggesting that this might be a time that we could think about some of the patent money going back into some kind of revenues that would go into better, um, you know, helping with tuition and stuff like that. So I just wanted to show this one other slide. So we've all seen this. Here's college tuition, medical care. So the price indexes for those two top ones are, are not taxable. So when you when you see the share of, in, of spending that's going into college and medical care, and here's commodities down here, which is much more heavily taxed. So that's another situation that has to be overcome. So. Um, as you would imagine, the state revenue contacts are very worried about tariffs. The ones in the agricultural area are very worried about ag prices, and you're seeing that kind of their leading index is falling off sharply. Um, and 
this other just sense that I wanted to throw out there um, is that when I talk to the revenue estimators now, there's much more of a concern about structural issues, whereas before they were more concentrated on cyclical issues. So they are worried about what happens in a downturn now with revenues, weak, rainy day funds, not big enough, and so on. But there's also the concern about income inequality. Um, you know, if more, if more wealth is being generated in the asset markets, there's a recent um, Urban Institute paper that showed that 60% of people who have two to five million dollars, 10 to 50 million, and um, over 100 million are reporting taxable returns of, of under 2%. So that if, that, if we're having more on the high income, high wealth side, and less on the wage side, that's also something that's not going to play out successfully, I would say. Thanks for that. I'm going to give you, try to give you guys um, a perspective of what it's been like with state and local governments for managing money. Um, and so I'm going to try to do this in a brevity of time. And some of the things that I've looked at are, are very similar to Philippus. Some are a little different. Uh, this is the tax reform over, overview of munis. Um, the most important thing on here, as we'll see, is there are actually two, the lack of salt deductions, which is having a major effect on states, particularly the Northeast high-tax states. And the last part, where municipal, municipalities can no longer do advanced refundings, because as we'll see, that has been the source of up to a third of the supply in the last few years prior to the tax bill. Uh, this kind of just takes you through the, the technicals of the over, overview of munis from the tax bill. Credit quality, there's no question, as we're going to see, credit quality has improved. Think about over the last few years, not just things like sales taxes, which of course from the economy standpoint helps the states to boom, but state and local taxes on the uh, ad valorem side have increased uh, well. So state and local governments are in great shape. We worry now, partly because of the tax bill, about where you go from here, because there's clearly, with the non-deductibility issue, going to be some fight back uh, on the part of citizens to states to either uh, lower their tax rates or state and local go or local governments to cut their mill rate because of the you know the new rules with the lack of salt deductions and making property taxes that much more onerous so the real question for us as portfolio managers is if both the local governments and the state governments cave and cut taxes uh, what happens if they don't cut expenditures and so as portfolio managers we worry about eroding debt service coverage and that doesn't happen right away but it happens down the road and as we all know state and local governments they're the last people to feel a recession because of the lagging collections and they're also the last people to come out of a recession as well you can see here the last two years you know many more states have had uh, uh, better than projected uh, general fund collections uh, I, I would suggest that's probably going to slow down and here, a little bit, rainy day funds have actually increased as a, as a percentage. But I would suggest that's probably leveling off. You look at the total amount of state next supported uh, debt. Um, as that has dropped percentage-wise, it, it, I think this is a holdover from the recession. Most states have been much more, even though issuance was up, as we'll see, a lot of that had been refunding issuance. So, you know, people are still watching their pennies a lot more than, you know, you, you did prior to the Great Recession. And I think one of the things that you're going to see, particularly on the local level now, 
is this fight back because of salt and they're going to they're going to say by god i am not going to vote for any more uh, bond issues or they better be really needy and we don't need five new police cars we can do it with one and let's use the old football field so there's really that retrenchment issue that's going on in in certainly voters minds particularly on the local level uh, you can look here this is aggregate state debt levels uh, i think the important number is the one at the bottom where you're down to about uh, 1.8 percent as a percentage of you know gross state product so it, it tells you that issuance has been more carefully constructed this is a random sample about different states because if you rank states new jersey would be in on here uh unfunded other post-employment benefits it's it's no coincidence that connecticut and illinois are on the list and like i said if, if they included new jersey it would be on here uh and this is worrisome. Uh, it'll continue to be worrisome. This is a little chart showing the marginal state income tax rate and net migration out. As you can see in the upper northwest quadrant, you can see Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, um, Illinois just below that. I th this is not my chart. This was uh, one that we had at the NFMA, which I got permission to use. I think what would be more interesting is if you had this chart that combined not only state income tax rates, but average local property tax rates, uh, you probably even have stronger uh, correlation numbers. This is the supply of municipal bonds. It's taking you out the last five years. You can see the upper trend line right to the end of 17. It drops since then. And it drops since then because you're no longer able to do advanced refundings, which I think most of you know what they are, but it's as simple as this. If the Florida Turnpike Authority issued bonds in, back in 2013 in the middle of the taper tantrum at 5%, they could turn around today if they were allowed and issue new bonds at 3%, put that money aside, put it in treasuries, and call those old bonds at the first call date. There had been a tried and true way that municipalities cut their costs over time. They don't have it anymore. And so, you know, that, that for us, it was a little perplexing that Congress passed it. And because it really doesn't save them any money. They thought, oh, well, the municipalities will just issue bonds in the taxable bond market to do advanced refundings. But of course, you know, issuing the taxable market is more expensive. So henceforth, they won't do that. So they're not issuing bonds and the government is not collecting uh, any extra revenue. I hope if they revisit the tax bill, they change that because not only will it help the supply of municipal bonds, which is very constricted right now, but it will also help the municipalities down the road because rates have dropped so far. And part of it is because of the lack of refundings on the muni side. But, you know, treasuries have come down as well. You could have municipalities today issue bonds that they issued less than a year ago. So think about it. They were issuing 4% bonds back in the fall of 2018. They could pre-refund those today. Here you can see the, the problem. Look at those big issuance years of 2016 and 17. Over a third of those years had issuance that was basically advanced refunding issues. Um, 2017's was probably overstated because so many issuers moved up their issuance to the end of the year to beat the tax bill. You can see that 69 million in 2017 that turned into a record month and a record year. And since then, it's been an onward decline of issuance. And that has made itself a uh, effect in how people manage money, but also where tax exempt bond rates are. And from our perspective, they've never been lower. So even though you don't have much issuance, boy, if you had a state that could issue long 100 year bonds, I would do it. They're not doing it, but you've, you've never had an opportunity like right now. It's a real muni squeeze. I got a piece coming out on this this week. But this shows you a general obligation cur muni curve, California and New York. And this is right before the tax bill got passed in 12 one seventeen. You can see the spreads here going out three months out to 30 years. And it, it isn't particularly wide. So you didn't have a huge advantage 
In other words, you could you didn't give up much by buying California and New York. And in fact, what we did in our general market portfolios bought a lot of California and New York paper in general market portfolios because we said, "Wow, if this tax bill gets passed the way they're talking, the demand side for Cal and New York and New Jersey paper is going to be huge as you go forward." Indeed, that's was that is what happened. And now you look at where it's been squeezed down to, and a lot of these spreads have doubled and not only have this huge huge demand side that's fit into mostly the shorter end of the curve but also some of the longer end because there's no other place for investors to get income that's sheltered from taxes. We know uh, that you, with the SALT provisions, I mean, there's uh, that game is, is out. Uh, the re reduction in the mortgage interest from a million dollars down to seven fifty. dollars think about, think about that math. Someone would sit there and say, well, I had a million and a half dollar home. I had a million dollars, I put half a million dollars down. I borrowed a million. I've been able to deduct the interest cost. I'm thinking of buying a two and a half million dollar home, but you know what? It has to be a new mortgage. It won't be deductible beyond 750. Maybe I'll stay where I am and just buy more municipal bonds. I actually think some of that is going on. The other thing that's very strange, though, is that, it, and it's not on this chart, if you looked at where like Cal and New York paper is as a percentage of treasury bonds, the yields are so low to the point where it's almost uneconomical for them, those investors to buy them. In other words, they would be better off buying treasuries and probably breaking even, buying almost anything other than a treasury, an agency, a high-grade corporate, you name it, and be ahead of buying municipal bonds. And the best rationale for that that we can think of is that a lot of smart money has glommed into the shorter end of the municipal bond market thinking they want their money turned over faster in the next couple of years because they're expecting either another change in the tax law, perhaps a change in the White House, or both. Um, this is just a quick run. These are five-year credit default swaps, and we I included not only some high-tax states like California, New York, New Jersey, but also low-tax states like Florida and Texas. And the remarkable thing is that since the tax Tax bill, they've all come down. So it's almost like if you looked at the credit default swap market, they're treating the high tax states and the low tax states all the same. And I would suggest, given some of the net migration numbers, that might be a mistake. And Washington's last one. That's me. Thanks. Thanks, Luz. Okay, so um, it's always a, a good idea to end on a happy note, so I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> Illinois. Um, as, as was described, as, as sort of the uh, uh, Darth Vader of the panel. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, is that a little bit more in just elaboration on what's been different about the recovery from this recession. I mean, similar to the, uh, the comments that were made about how slow the labor recovery was, revenues have re recovered at a very slow pace for states. Um, only this year have states actually gotten back to their pre-recession revenue levels. So they managed most of this period of time by being really tough on expenditures. Um, they didn't really see any sort of expo explosive revenue growth. Um, the other thing which um, was mentioned was a particularly brilliant paper by um, Leslie and myself um, identified that really coming out of the 2000-2001 recession, there was a trend break. And one of the things we saw was an explosion of volatility in terms of state revenues. And where that showed up was mostly in personal income tax revenues. States became more dependent on personal income tax revenues. And what was interesting was that volatility wasn't, wasn't driven by policy changes. It had more to do with um, dynamics of income over this period of time changing. And states really haven't adjusted to that. Um, what they've simply seen is they have a much more volatile structure that they're trying to manage. They've also been um, exposed twice to different changes in federal policy that have also made their situation a lot more um, complicated. And so I would suggest that at this point, state revenues are system are basically more stressed than they've been in the past. Um, you know, again, the sales tax base reaches less of the sort of the economic activity within the economy. Um, they've been slow to tax services. And what you've seen is states relying on sort of alternative measures to sort of boost revenues. So, you know, everything from marijuana taxes to doing um, sports gambling, um, gasoline tax increases. 31 states have increased their gasoline tax to help fund um, infrastructure. So that's been the one area where they've made some sort of systematic change 
changes, but you've seen a slow ability for states to adapt their revenue systems to some sort of like a new dynamic. So they've been in some ways playing um, sort of reactionary policy in terms of where things are. Um, so let's turn to Illinois. So is Illinois a cautionary tale or is it a fixable problem? Um, so the thing I wanted to suggest is what makes Illinois special and not in a good way is the fact that we manage not to just have one deficit, but we actually have two deficits. Um, if you look at the state's you know, structural budget um, accounting, what is clear is, is that the state doesn't bring in enough revenue to actually cover the general operations of the government. Then on top of that, we also have a massive pension underfunding. Um, so these twin deficits going forward really puts Illinois in somewhat of a unique position um, and not necessarily in a good way. So this is a figure that was put together by a project that was done at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, it was a fiscal futures project. And what they did was they identified a couple of interesting things. First of all, coming out of 2000, Illinois started running a deficit. Um, so at this point, we've had 19 years of running a deficit on any sort of regular basis. And what these figures represent is something that I think is very important for people to consider, is this is an all funds accounting for Illinois. Because one of the other problems that occurred over this period of time was the general fund increasingly um, contains less of total state spending. You start creating other funds, sort of off balance sheet funds, that are more responsible for, for expenditures, but are less trackable, right? So if you want to be really sort of negative, this is kind of like an Enron accounting structure that you're putting in place. And so what you ended up with is, is you didn't recognize the fact that you weren't actually bringing enough revenue to actually cover the cost of state expenses. You know, part of this is an accounting issue. I mean, states use cash accounting, and if there was accrual accounting, they would recognize these liabilities, particularly underfunding their pensions much earlier, and it would become much more transparent in the way people would be able to respond to these things. So the bottom line is we have a massive sort of gap, both on the pension side and also on the regular um, budget side of the um, equation. Um, so how did this happen? Well, um, you know, sometimes I, I've said that, you know, Illinois' slogan should be, we never met a questionable budget practice that we don't love. Um, but um, the other thing you can consider is that our budgeting practice is clearly less transparent than it should be. So the issue for Illinois, the way I think about this, is that the true tax cost of providing government services was never identified to taxpayers, right? So I lived in Illinois in 2000, and I didn't know that the amount of taxes I was paying wasn't really sufficient to cover the cost of government expenses, assuming that that also included pension liabilities going forward. So for a long period of time, <laughs> under this model, I'm theoretically underpaying my taxes, right? I'm not paying enough taxes to cover the actual cost of the services I'm consuming over this period of time. And so it comes to a situation that is just a complete lack of transparency. So this allows this liability to build up over a long time, become really, really large, and it also has real implications for how you could potentially solve it, which obviously is not gonna be real easy going forward. Um, so is there a plan to get out of this hole? Well, there have been a lot of them considered at this point. Uh, governor Pritzker, our new governor, ran on the idea that he wanted to change the state's constitution to permit us to have a graduated income tax. A uh, graduate rate income tax, he believes we would be able to close some of this gap in terms of pension liabilities going forward. Um, there's also been discussion to change the constitution to permit pension payments to be cut to retirees. Um, Illinois has probably the most strict constitutional um, requirement that does not allow you to cut any pensions going forward. Even um, any, it's not just accrued benefits, it's also projected benefits. And that means that the liability tends to be, at least the way the court has interpreted it, is being fixed. So we haven't been able to trim the expenditure side of this. So you have to come up with a revenue answer. Um, there was a proposal last year um, by an accounting professor at the University of Illinois to issue um, north of $100 billion worth of pension bonds. Um, and the problem with that is, is in talking to people like John, what they said is you wouldn't be able to place $100 billion in pension bonds probably anywhere if you were issuing them on Illinois' part. Plus, it's obviously a highly risky strategy to try to sort of recapitalize our entire pension system just based on issuing pension bonds. Um, the other thing that public finance economists have really favored but has gotten very little traction is just to look at some of the structural components of Illinois' tax structure and change them. Um, the first thing is just broadening the basis. Um, Illinois taxes very few services, even in comparison to our neighboring states. Um, Iowa taxes over 
over 120 services. Um, Wisconsin taxes about over 90. Um, we tax about 30 in Illinois, so you could just broaden out the sales tax base. We could get revenue out of that. The other is to tax retiring income. Illinois doesn't tax any retiring income uh, under the income tax structure, and the idea is, is you could include that, and both those things could potentially raise more revenue going forward. The big fly in the ointment, of course, is, is, the, is really the political question, and the political question is, any of these higher taxes pay for something you already consumed, right? So if you're a politician, what you're going to tell people is, you're going to pay higher taxes, and you're not going to get anything in return for it. Um, you don't receive any new government services. I mean, people are willing to pay higher taxes if they think they're going to get better education or better roads or something like that out of it, but that's not going to be the case with solving this problem. So it's a very large liability that you're essentially asking people to um, sort of suck up. And in many cases, it obviously could have the potential for encouraging people to either leave the state or try to avoid paying these liabilities going forward. Um, so if you weren't depressed yet, I left you with this last quote from Warren Buffett, which I think sums up kind of what the investment challenge is. As he says, in the public sector, you know it's a disaster. If I were re relocating into some state a huge unfunded pension plan, I'm walking into liabilities. And those are big numbers, really big numbers. And when you see what they would have to do, I say to myself, why do I want to build a plant there that has to sit there for 30 or 40 years? And so that's the problem, is, is eventually these liabilities are going to have to be paid for by future generations and future investors in Illinois. And that's just a fundamentally kind of unattractive um, kind of a proposition to ask people to pay for. Um, so that, that I think I'm I'm not sure if we should do it. Right. I, 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 I think successfully I'll be, so. All right, so we have a question and answers. Anybody want to start off? Uh, uh, Rick, yeah. have you looked at the um, dynamic effect of raising taxes in Illinois as far as the net migration goes? Uh, have there been any studies done on if um, the uh, new tax proposals go through and they do have a graduated uh, tax rate? How will that actually raise money or will we just have more rich people leave? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I haven't seen anything conclusive on that. I mean, I've seen different studies that assume that there'd be a certain amount of rich people would leave and apparently the governor's estimates on what the gains are supposed to take some of those dynamic effects into consideration. Um, but it's hard to say. I mean, again, it's, it's going to be depending on what the rates are that are locked in and what your alternative places that you could be moving to and what rates you might be exposed to there. So assuming you're not moving to a tax-free environment, you're still going to have costs. I mean, and wherever you go, so it's, it's going to be hard. And if you look at Illinois' net migration figures, they're hard to interpret because, I mean, if you look at where Illinois actually gets more people move into from any place, um, it's it, now it's half of what move out. But it's Indiana. Um, our largest in, you know, increase of population is from Indiana, really a lower tax state. And so people are moving here for economic opportunity. Similarly, if you look at where people are leaving Illinois for, number four on that list is California, which is a, a higher tax state. So it's hard to disentangle exactly what the motivation is for people leaving. Query in theory, it probably is going to be positive if taxes are higher, but how much that actually motivates people on the margins is going to be hard to tell. Just a quick comment. Um, many years ago, there, there was a millionaire tax that was implemented in uh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And in New Jersey, Jersey's largest uh, taxpayer, David Tepper, left and went to Washington, uh, went to New Florida and blew a hole in their budget and they had to have an emergency session. And I'll just remind everybody that uh, Ken Griffin and Sam Zell are the two largest taxpayers in this state and they're already half one foot out the door to begin with. And Jim, you know, that was that was before even the last one because last year they put an extra millionaire's tax on income above five million. So he moved out before even it got marginally higher. And now you don't see Carolina Panthers. Correct. Jim. Uh, Rick, uh, again, uh, and I guess you know, this 
Children and residents are very interested in what you have to say. <laughs> um, you didn't talk about the estate tax. Uh, yeah. I work for a private bank. We hear a lot of concern about the Illinois estate tax yeah. as a motivation for uh, leaving. Does does that have more explanatory factor of migration? It, it could. I mean, it's certainly plausible. I mean, I, I think that the biggest issue which I, I faced and um, is that most of the tax solutions are looking at um, taxing potentially mobile factors within Illinois, and so. Anytime you increase the taxation on mobile factors, you're obviously going to get some movement on the margin. And so I think the concern is, is that what, you know, how could you have solve this problem by not necessarily um, encouraging people to lose it? Because I mean, again, looking at it from my perspective, I'm, I'm close enough to retirement, right? I theoretically, for this 19-year period of time, didn't pay enough taxes to cover the cost of the services I consumed. But if I leave the state, I win, right? I don't, I don't pay that, right? Um, but but somebody who moves in then has to make up for the fact that I, you know, in this model underpaid my taxes for this long period of time. So, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to incentivize people to say that the, the way I win is simply by leaving, right? Um, so you pre prefer to have a, t a tax solution that wasn't necessarily so heavily reliant on mobile factors of, of the economy. I was just going to say, as, as you're talking about out migration, mm -hmm. based on that, uh, when I was looking at this for the state of New Jersey, uh, the numbers never showed, uh, the, out, the aggregate numbers never showed huge out migration. But if you looked underneath uh, the hood there, you can see that there was a large out migration from the various wealthy, the most wealthy, and the very poor. And so you're losing, you know, poor, the very wealthy, and what was happening, the reason why the numbers weren't showing is because international in-migration was covering it. <laughs> and so you saw a lot of folks coming in from India, for example, into North Jersey. And so they're making the numbers look like the population growth was only like a half percent, when in fact you had out-migration. So anyway, there's lots of ways the numbers can be <laughs> hidden, but there's no question I think the Laffer curves in, in place, it's certainly in New Jersey. Well, I'm going to raise the marginal rate in New Jersey to 11%. Um, you failed on that. But can I ask a question right here? Mm -hmm. Does inflation solve this problem? Uh, well, having worked in state government, yeah, inflation was always government's best friend, and the problem that we haven't had it has been because, I mean, you just had a bracket creep. I mean, most states, particularly when it came to graduate income tax rates, didn't end up index the brackets, right? So people just moved up as their incomes moved up into higher brackets, and same thing happened on sales taxes. I mean, as, as Felipe pointed out, is that, you know, simply as higher sales tax prices went in, you just got higher reserves. So this protracted period of time in which you've had you know, no inflation or very low inflation has clearly reduced kind of the, you know, the sort of the but normal the lift. Are the liabilities indexed? Um, the liabilities, uh, well, see, this is where Illinois, this is where we also get into wor even worse shape. So um, on the pension liability, um, we guarantee a 3% compounded annual increase in the pension. Minimum, right? No, 3%, that's it. But it can't go below 3 right? It can't go below 3 right. So it's a 3% compounded COLA. And so the problem is, is when this was granted, um, was put in place, this was during a period of very high inflation. So it was considered almost punitive, right? That you were going to have a 3% COLA, right? Um, but in, instead, what's happened now is obviously it ends up being a very generous increase. And actually, if you look at the curve and part of what drives the liabilities for Illinois, a lot of it is this 3% COLA. Because even a lot of states that did 3% minimums, it was just a simple interest, right? It wasn't a, a compounded number. Um, and so this has become a problem. But again, the court has interpreted this as being constitutionally protected as a benefit that you can't. The call is the call. The call, the call is a and the three percent call is actually constitutionally. So you're right. If we got you know significantly higher inflation, we could bid down this call. But Jim. Yeah, more Illinois questions to the Illinois guys. Uh, this, for, this is for John and Rick. Um, are, the, are the two choices that the state has is either increased revenue or possibly a constitutional amendment to cut uh, pension benefits? Is there bankruptcy a possibility in this case? Uh, not for a state. Not for a state. state can't. A state can't be clear. It's a. It's a sovereign. So. But I, I've always wondered when they lost that Illinois Supreme Court decision. Your two choices were to either try to amend the Illinois Constitution, or you could have appealed it 
to the United States Supreme Court, and neither was done. And I, I, I have a feeling neither was done because of politics, but I never heard an answer. <laughs> So, Don. Yes. Is there any estimate of how long we have? Like, when does this have to be resolved by? <laughs> um, well, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that, that, that's part of the problem. That's part of what makes, you know, solving the pension problem, frankly, so difficult is because, like, I mean, even for the worst funded, you know, some of the local pension funds, you're still looking at, like, a, a drop dead date of, like, 15 years, right? Which, in political terms, is a lifetime. Time, right, so from yeah, fifteen from here, right. So it's like it's not that you're not able to make your payments; it's just you're drawing down. You have you know negative net amortization right now on a lot of these funds. So even if they're not even making it up on investment, they're still adding to the burden on the annual basis. John, how long before the bond markets close in that scenario? If it's fifteen years, the drop dead date, will the bond markets stay open for fifteen years? Well, they tend to anticipate things in advance, so I would say that you'd see that priced in earlier. Um, how much earlier, I don't know, but, you know. The, Isn't it already priced in? Some, yeah. Some, yeah, yeah, I mean, in, in that tax, but, you know, look at, look at, you have the same effects, for example, when, um, Illinois debt sold off after that court decision years ago and spreads widened out and then started coming back in. I mean, the actuality of it is that from, a, and, and my friend Andrew can back me up on this, Illinois has been one of the best performing states, you know, out there because it's, you know, it, the, the spreads have compressed partly because of a better economy. More, mostly because you've had this big yield compression as yields have dropped. Yeah. That being said, fewer investors own Illinois, so it is much, it's held by you know, fewer investors than it was 10 years ago by an exponential amount. So if Illinois were to really start, you know, really start trading off, it could just be a bloodbath because there's just not the support in the market for it, but there was. Even that's a good point. Ago. But we have 14 and a half years. <laughs> well, that's just, that's just for the worst part. Yeah, so that's the market. The state was higher than that. I mean, the state was higher. Than that. <laughs> uh, so, so one frame of reference, for everybody, you can look around and say, who doesn't have this problem? And so Wisconsin doesn't. South Dakota doesn't. But they have a different governance structure. So in both of those states, the trustees of the pension fund have the right to change the benefits. And they do. So in the case, for example, in South Dakota, when the funding ratio falls, let's say, to 70%, there's no COLA. So it's in the structure to manage liabilities. So you have this, you have this intractable problem is if the liabilities are locked and there's no feedback mechanism and you don't put enough money in, um, the, John's graph was a bit terrifying, then there, there is no way out. If you're not putting enough money in, you can't change the liability stream. And um, so that, that's why I asked how long the bond markets would be. I meant open, like you can't issue. They just close. I mean... Puerto Rico is the example of getting the law on it. Right. That's, that's what I was going to bring up. I mean, you know, for years, for years, the market accepted Puerto Rico, even though you put all the buyers in a room, put a gun to their heads, and they knew that there was a lot of issues going on. But it was available. They, they're, they're, they're clearly misrated. So, you know, it was a reason to buy. Um, it, you've gone through this mess with Puerto Rico, and... The one thing that I would never say is that if they found a way in a couple of years to come back to the bond market, the people would buy the bonds again. We, we, if, if history has taught us anything, is that we've never learned a lesson on that. Argentina sells more. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Another technique has been to securitize tax revenue so that a certain type of tax, a sales tax or whatever, or sharing from the state is sold to a separate entity, and then that is property of that entity, and that's what secures the bonds, which of course reduces the revenue available for general funds. So that's one of the strategies they may be using to get around. Well, certainly, the city of Chicago has already done that. That will get tested in the Supreme Court because of what's gone on at Cofina in, in Puerto Rico, too. I mean, that, that will end up, I'm sure, on the Supreme Court. 
So I have a question for Philippa and uh, possibly for Rick. Have tax revenues become more, more pro-cyclical post the financial crisis? Yes, and that's also something that was in his paper, that um, his and Leslie's paper, that um, they have become more pro-cyclical. And that was one of the things, it's funny, because in 2005, Larry Oksan, when he was still the CBO, came to one of the revenue estimating conferences, and he said, <laughs> to a room full of people, um, you can't forecast personal income taxes out more than a year, and it's a waste of taxpayers' money to try to do so. So already then it was clearly a problem. And that was because the capital gains and all of that are so volatile. So why, uh, I guess, why have they become more pro-cyclical? Do you have a sense of why? Um, again, a lot of it has to do with the components of income. So it was, I mean, it's partially it was capital gains being, um, and the realizations of when they time, they tend to time more with the cycle. And so it became, and withholding becomes a less and less important component, the predictable part of the underlying income stream. So it's, it's that structure of how people were being compensated that tended to sort of blow up the volatility. Another factor is that uh, a graduated income tax becomes more dependent on the upper income right. people and their revenue by nature is more uh, volatile. Yeah. Yeah. This is a question for anyone in the group and, and Rick relates to the quote the Warren Buffett uh, quote that's up uh, on the screen. Has there been any real noticeable measurable consequences for states running their finances poorly? I mean is it does it correlate to lower you know we've had poor economic growth in Illinois relative to na the nation and the Great Lakes composite is that due to that can, can, is there any is there any linkage I, I certainly think there is and you know some of this is exacerbated now by the salt provision so let's tell somebody at lunch today um, <laughs> And I was talking to Don about this last night. I saw someone a month ago at a municipal research conference, and he lives in New Canaan, Connecticut. So we know that Connecticut has almost taken a, a let's chase all the good business out of Connecticut approach, uh, whether it's from GE to Smith & Wesson. You look, at a, you look at a place like New Canaan, Connecticut, where years ago, you know, you, it was hard to find a house there, and they rarely traded up, or really tr rarely traded, and are all expensive. My friend told me they just passed an ordinance a couple of months ago, which prevents anybody from putting in a for sale sign in front of their house. And because they didn't want to give the impression that the whole town was for sale, which of course it is. And, and that's that's true in a lot of other neighborhoods in the high tax states where you know perhaps salt caught people by surprise um, and the interesting corollary to that is if you think about people leaving there and go to, going to low tax states if they can sell people in Sarasota where we're based friends of mine that are real estate agents had banner years in 16 and 17 and for the most of the first part of last year you talk to them this year, their business is dreadful. And I'm convinced that a lot of it is that the the people trading their bigger homes in the high tax states is ground to a halt because they can't sell them. So they're not buying homes in Florida. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. I put up the job growth again. So this is payroll, employment, and growth since the peak in 2000. So it's an absolute number. So uh, Connecticut is minus 6,000. Uh, Florida is 3.2 million more jobs. Florida is 1.8 million more jobs. And since uh, 2000, Illinois has gained 114,000 jobs. And if you started that in 2010, no state has lost more people than Illinois. Correct. No state has lost more, Bill? No. Since 2010. And so since we're getting a lot of questions for Rick, I can't help but mention the fact that uh, if anybody's interested, we will be hosting in this room on December 13th our Economic Outlook Symposium. The keynote speaker, uh, which basically means Rick will have three times the amount of time to depress you. <laughs> 
is, uh, is, is Rick uh, Mattoon, who is going to uh, focus on six months from now where we are with regard to these issues uh, for, for public financing, in particular for Illinois. If you, and anyway, if you'd like to get an invite to that, it's an invite only conference. Uh, please uh, give me your business card before you leave today if you are not already getting invites. So any final questions? All right, we're done. It's a good day. Thanks again. And for those who want to walk to Greektown, 515 in the lobby. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for a wonderful panel. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And please let us know if there are any additional questions. Thank you.